Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Keogh School of Global Affairs here at Notre Dame University. A quick thanks to all of our partners in this effort, starting with Riot Films, Vulcan, Performance, uh, Vulcan Productions, International Rescue Committee, World Affairs, and a particular thank you to Sky Fitzgerald and Spin Film. You've created a remarkable and timely film that has really captured the attention of our students and our faculty here at the Keogh School, where we aim to train global affairs practitioners and professionals focused on the challenges to human dignity by accentuating a greater focus on integral human development. So we really thank you, Sky, uh, and your team at SPIN. Let me, you will have seen on the screen, I know, longer bios for each of our panelists earlier, but let me just refresh that with a sentence or two of each so you can uh, fix a bio with the face, starting with Nazanin Ash, uh, Pre Vice President for Global Policy and Advocacy at the International Rescue Committee. Uh, Naz has, uh, before working at IRC, had uh, senior positions at the State Department, USAID, as a White House fellow and in the field in East Africa. We also have Sky Fitzgerald, a filmmaker and co-producer of Hunger Ward, uh, who has an ex expansive body of work. But just for today, I wanna call uh, your attention to his humanitarian trilogy, uh, which includes Hunger Ward, but also Lifeboat from 2018 and 50 Feet from Syria in, in 2015, that combined that trilogy tells the story of dislocation and suffering at the heart of the global refugee crisis. Next is Rahul Oka, a valued colleague uh, at the Keogh School where he is a research associate professor at the Keogh School as well as in the Department of Anthropology at Notre Dame. He studies the dynamics of human responses to conditions of violence, poverty and vulnerability including conflict and disasters. Lastly, I'm Dennis McDonough. I'm a professor of the practice here at the Keogh School, and I've spent some time uh, in the US government working on a range of issues to include uh, Yemen. So you can imagine that this is a particularly poignant uh, film for me. I wanna just heads you up that we're gonna be asking for your questions uh, after some opening statements. Please, uh, feel free to text your questions to 541-291-5377. Just a quick overview that the conflict in Yemen that hangs over this moving documentary and that has led to the suffering so powerfully depicted uh, really dates to 2014. The Congressional Research Service characterizes the start and intensification of the conflict this way started when the Northern Yemen-based Ansar Allah, also commonly referred to as the Houthis, took over the capital of Sana'a. In 2015, the Houthis moved south toward the city of Aden, prompting Yemeni President Hadi, who had fled to Saudi Arabia, to appeal for international intervention. Saudi Arabia and a hastily assembled international coalition with American support launched a military offensive aimed at restoring Hadi's rule and evicting Houthis from the capital and other major cities while imposing a military and commercial blockade on the country. Since then, this conflict has created what the United Nations characterizes as the world's largest humanitarian crisis, which still threatens worse, namely the worst famine in a hundred years resulting in, according to data aggregated by the Council on Foreign Relations Global Tracker, Global Conflict Tracker, more than 100,000 dead, 4 million forced from their homes, 24 million in need of assistance. Hospitals and food storage facilities have been bombed and humanitarian infrastructure severely compromised. Now, our hope is that this discussion can cover the range of issues from the very personal work depicted at the bedside in the hospital in the Phoenix Center in Yemen, to the geopolitical considerations in the world's capitals and in 
places like the UN Security Council. Our panelists will lead us through, starting with Sky, uh, giving us the filmmaker's perspective in Yemen, then to Naz to hear how humanitarians are struggling with the issues that Sky identifies in the, in the film. And then going to Rahul to hear about what Yemen tells us about the refugee crisis, not only in Yemen, but beyond Yemen as well. At, after that, we'll return to your questions. So I, I reiterate one more time, if you have questions, please text them to 541-291-5377. So Sky, with our thanks once again, over, you, over to you to start our conversation. Well, thank you, thank you, Dennis, for that great introduction and context. Um, I, I think I, I think I want to start just by acknowledging that um, I was inspired to do this project in part by the photography work of colleagues in journalism. You know, photos, photos by Lindsay Adario, um, Tyler Higgs, Skiles Clark. Um, those all sort of inspired me as someone who's driven by images. And, and there was one photo in particular by um, Tyler Hicks of Amal Hussein, uh, a 12 year old girl who was treated by Makia Maji, the nurse that we showcase in the film, and who eventually died of complications um, from starvation. And when I saw that image, um, that was a moment for me, not only as a filmmaker, but as a human being, where I had to ask myself, how is it possible that on this still fertile planet we live on, that a child could die of starvation. And so when we began this film, I made a commitment to simply bear witness and not shy away from whatever we found. And um, that resolve was tested. So you know, even on our first day of filming, um, an infant, Asila, passed away in front of us. And we witnessed child after child die for lack of basic nutrients. It was incredibly sobering, but it also strengthened my resolve to ensure that we didn't whitewash what we saw and that we honored the trust that families put in us to capture and share these intimate moments. Um, so, you know, the, the grief and sorrow that is in the film that accompanies the death of a child, you know, I think is universal and something that the global community desperately needs to be reminded of, especially in Yemen, where even as we have this conversation, children dying of starvation in 2020. And I am horrified by that fact. And that was the primary motivation for the film. And it continues to be the primary motivation for us to ensure that we bring the film to the greatest audience that we can. Sky, thanks. Uh, Naz. Thanks so much, Dennis. Thanks so much to all the panelists in the audience tonight. I'm really privileged to be here to share some perspective from the International Rescue Committee. We've worked in Yemen since 2012, providing health and nutrition and water and sanitation services delivering essential uh, drugs and medical supplies to hospitals and operating mobile health units. We play a critical role in Yemen alongside many other uh, NGO partners, supporting over 60% of the functioning health facilities and partnering with leaders like Dr. Al-Sadiq and Nurse Mahdi, profiled in the film so powerfully, in providing humanitarian aid in some of the most powerful and um, challenging, uh, you know, against some of the most powerful forces and in some of the most challenging circumstances um, anywhere in the world. I think Skye's question is really the right one, you know, how can this happen? And I think what Yemen really illuminates is the human cost of war, and in particular, the human cost of a war in which um, humanitarian law is trampled upon. You know, humanitarian law, which calls upon parties to conflicts to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure and ensure that aid reaches those most in need. This is, as Dennis, you said, the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. But importantly, critically, it's a man-made disaster. You know, Yemen's economy has shrunk by 50 percent over the past five years. The value of its currency dropped 65 percent in a single year. You know, combined with disruptions to food supply as a function of the conflict, um, food prices are 150% higher than they were before the war. 
and the loss of livelihoods has left over 80% of Yemenis in poverty. These are the circumstances that result in the fact that 20 million people today, two thirds of the population are food insecure, including 10 million who are acutely food insecure and at risk of famine. When you have schools and hospitals and water and sanitation systems that have been destroyed, that means clean water is out of reach for two thirds of the country. Health facilities have been targeted by warring parties over 120 times since 2015, a blatant violation of international law that's left only half of the country's health facilities fully functional. What that means is basic health care is out of reach for 10 million children. Ultimately, the conflict has caused nearly a quarter million deaths, 100,000, as Dennis noted, directly as a result of violence and indiscriminate attacks on civilians, but another 130,000 as a result of these secondary impacts of conflict, poverty and food insecurity and a lack of basic health care. Now, uh, Sky, thanks uh, for the obviously very profound and, and alarming uh, introductions here. Uh, Rahul, to you. Thank you. Now, I'm an anthropologist, and I've actually been working in the refugee camps of northern Kenya for about 12 years now. And since then, I've also looked at refugee and asylum situations in South Asia, as well as Eastern Europe, especially in Serbia, when they managed a, a million asylum seekers going through Serbia north into Hungary and into, into Croatia. And the one thing that, that, that strikes me is that the, poli the politics and logistics of conflict are intimately wrapped with the politics and logistics of relief. And, and whether you're ever, and providing this, whether you are trying to provide relief in an open conflict situation, which is, which is what's happening in Yemen, or in a 30-year refugee camp, which is um, uh, Kakuma or Dadaab refugee camps in, in Kenya. And what we're really looking at here, as an anthropologist, what I'm trying to look at is from the ground, from the stakeholders, from the refugees and the host communities, to the various organizations, and then to the policymakers. It's a very complex system that I've essentially summarized as impossible tasks undertaken by underfunded and understaffed organizations under impossible conditions whose primary goal remains the same to keep as many people alive and surviving until situations can change. And this is basically a task that would actually make Sisyphus actually seem relieved in, um, in, in, in comparison. And to understand that this lack of funding and a stretched and broken infrastructure is being exacerbated by donor fatigues and expedient needs, shutting down of borders, and, and, and also the way that relief actually functions into the ongoing war. I remember, not that I remember, I'm too young for this, but back in the Biafran War, a war that should have lasted for a year with 150,000 uh, civilian casualties became 1 million casualties in three years as relief was hijacked by different groups. And so, and, and, and so basically trying to unwrap this together, sometimes you're just left with the feeling that is this as good as it's going to get? And yet when you look at the film and you see the children dying on camera, this is something that every relief worker who's worked in the front line has actually seen. And we look at the ground level and then we go to the top where, where it, beyond the policymaking and uh, whether it's a UN bodies or whether it's INGOs, you're essentially looking at the geopolitical realities of alliance making and conflicts between allies and their enemies and whether you have state and non-state actors, and where there is little or no political will and a lot of economic realities, geopolitical and economic realities to consider that the people on the ground, the ones who pay the cost, whether they are the people who are suffering the actual brunt of the conflict or whether they are people who are working on the front line, the relief workers, they become the, uh, um, how do you say, the, the, the descamisados in, in Spanish, they become the disposables, they become the statistics. And, and, and uh, I mean, a shakeup of the system is something that is required. And to me, the film Hunger Ward, the one part of the film Hunger Ward that, 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 that really brought it was that the little girl who actually had a gluten sensitivity in any society with infrastructure, that would not have been a problem, but she came close to starvation because 
who is going to look at something like gluten sensitivity when people are actually dying of malnutrition because they are not getting enough food? So but at, at the end, as an anthropologist, I sit, to, I sit back and I say, the complexity is unbearable. And yet, as, as a global community, we, we are committed to trying to, 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 trying to bring some dignity to, to the people. And, 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 uh, and when we consider that, I mean, I'm going to turn it back to Sky, because I think you have a very powerful question that, that you need to ask over here. Um, yeah, so so let's dive in. Let's dive into the geopolitics a little bit, right? And uh, Dennis, forgive me in advance, but I, I I really feel like I wanted to make sure I asked this question because I think it's it's sort of geopolitics from the ground perspective, right? So um, if you recall in the film, you know we illustrate the impact of a missile strike in Sanaa that took place in October 16 um, at a memorial service. Um, and we spent some time with Ali Alakwa, who was a witness and survivor of that strike, who you hear him narrating sort of his experience during the course of the film. During that strike, um, a missile fired by the Saudi coalition with operational support of the US tore that building apart and killed an estimated 140 people, many of them women and children. The attack was a triple tap um, I don't know if I coined that or not, because it wasn't a double tap. It, in, in other words, there were three, three missiles. So as survivors fled and rescues arrived, a second and then a third missile struck, uh, apparently intent on killing as many survivors as possible. Fragments of those missiles were found in the wreckage, as reported by the New York Times and people on the ground, uh, that were made by Raytheon, an American company. The frustration with foreign intervention in Yemen is widespread throughout the country, and abroad, and the U.S.'s continued support of arms sales and operational support to Saudi Arabia was best summed up for me uh, when I was there by Makia Maji, the, the pediatric nurse in North Yemen. During an interview with her, at one point, she said, and I quote, feed the people and then kill them. That is how we feel. And I guess my question is, you know, what as someone who was in the administration when that missile strike happened, um, what would you say to Makia to this idea that the Saudi coalition in particular is responsible for much of the funding of for food aid to the country, but also directly responsible for indiscriminate missile strikes that have killed tens of, tens of thousands of civilians? Um, what would you say to Makia? And what would you say to Ali, the survivor of that missile strike? Well, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a tough question. Um, so let me, um, let, let me try to make four points and then uh, see, see what you think of this guy and, and uh, Rahul and, and Nas. But um, let, let me take a step back and, and remind you remind ourselves of what the theory of our case was that this conflict that, that the Saudis were going to initiate this conflict with or without us. We believe that we could help shape their approach and limit the scope of the conflict, hopefully for the better, by providing limited support designed to address the threat uh, posed by missiles on the Saudi border and the Houthi overflow of the Yemeni government. So we thought that the overriding objective for our limited support was defensive, to support security gains by pushing back on the Houthis while also minimizing civilian harm. So among other measures, we provided vetted intelligence, cleared intelligence, including a no strike list to direct them away from civilian targets. So if you take precision, precision guided munitions in this context, PGMs, which is something uh, that you referenced, Sky, became clear that the coalition's low-tech munitions were causing unnecessary civilian harm. 
And at least initially it was a question of whether uh, it was a question of whether the targeting was intentional as Nas's comments pointed out, or rather was a reflection of inadequate technology. Or was it a failure of the coalition to live up to its commitments to us and to others? Once it became clear how the precision guided munitions were being misused, and I think the case you point out is obvious in that regard, we reviewed the, we reviewed the sales and ultimately suspended them. Now, looking back, I think there has been a number of my colleagues who have said this was a mistake and made a public acknowledgement of that and then talked about what we could do better. And I think those steps are clear. One is we could use our leverage to push for a ceasefire and could restore something that we tried an awful lot, uh, but which has, for all intents and purposes, been suspended currently under the current US government to restore our kind of diplomatic effort to resolve the conflict rather than use leverage to impact the tactics of the conflict. So that's, I think, what we could do. Um, and I guess I'd just say I would acknowledge, Sky, that that was a mistake, as several of my, coll my colleagues have acknowledged. Um, notwithstanding a lot of efforts on civilian casualties, um, on putting in place um, requirements for the conditions that need to be met to use such um, munitions and such capabilities that President Obama put in place, which have subsequently been uh, also ignored. But notwithstanding all of that, <laughs> I think uh, what I would say is that I think this was a mistake. And the way we correct the mistake now is to use our leverage to resolve this diplomatically while also investing in the infrastructure that both Rahul and Nas have underscored is so critically needed. Now, look, I mean, uh, is any of this adequate to the heartbreaking images or to the strength of the question you just asked. Um, I'm not going to say that it absolutely is. But what we ought to do is make sure that we make this turn now. As Congress has been pressing the administration to do, going back to 2008 now, to that, sorry, 2018. So full stop. We have a lot of really, um, so I kind of feel like I want to give you a rebuttal or something because <laughs> I don't want to look, I don't want to look like I'm, I'm I, I don't, I don't want to look like I'm, I take this lightly because I surely don't. And, and so, so please, if there's something you want to rebut or go back at, I, I welcome that. But, um, uh, it's it's really sad is the bottom line, and I think and I think we have to fix this now. Yeah, well, no, the thing, thank you for that, Dennis. I, I guess um, a follow up thought would just be, you know, um, if if you had a magic wand, right, you could wave your magic wand um, and sort of um, alter our current um, government's approach to this conflict and support of this conflict, both operationally as well as arms sales. Uh, from U.S. companies that obviously aren't being monitored in the way that was initially thought or considered. Um, if you had that magic wand, what criteria would you put into place for a new administration or the current administration uh, 
to ensure that there, that there are not indiscriminate attacks that are defined as war crimes by all the all the rights agencies, right? I mean, we could list them, I'm sure yeah. you know, from the multiple direct hits on MSF facilities, for example, who had big crosses painted on the top. I mean, obviously there's been a misuse um, of this asymmetrical power. So if you could wave that wand, what, what criteria would you put into place? Yeah, it's a great question. And we're going to get to, there's a series of questions that have come in from our, our uh, guests too. And what I'd say in shorthand is the following, Sky. Um, President Obama gave a speech in 2013 about how, at the National Defense University about the conditions that he demanded be met before he would use this kind of capability. And he said he wanted from us that we meet a standard of near certainty of zero civilian casualties. So near certainty, zero civilian casualties. He put around that a requirement that said for transparency purposes, we're gonna report on a regular basis what the civilian casualties were and how we came to those conclusions. And then we're gonna open ourselves up to annual meetings with the organizations that you're talking about who may dispute our methodology, but that act of transparency would be important. And then lastly, we would examine ways to seek compensation, which as you know, particularly in Yemen is uh, a, um, a practice. So I think in there are the, the makings of some infrastructure, but there's a whole set of tools that we have to do a better job of implementing and deploying around diplomacy before we even get into these tactical, these military tactical questions. And what I hope is in a new administration, diplomacy becomes the tactic of first resort, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so we have a series of questions and uh, maybe as we answer these, excuse me, as we answer these, uh, Nas had, I think Nas and Rahul were really kind of getting at this, this humanitarian's dilemma, impossible tasks under impossible circumstances to a very minimalist end. Um, that you might, especially since we're training, then hopefully a bunch of humanitarians who are going to go do this better than we all do it. Um, maybe we can chew on that a little bit. But there's there's two question, two types of questions that I, I would group together. One is how is the uh, how is COVID impacting the humanitarians' work, and how is it in is, how is it impacting so that's really a question I think for you, Nas. And then how is it impacting the situation on the ground? And maybe uh, Sky and Rahul, you can comment a little bit about that. So what's the impact of the pandemic on this? The next is how about advocacy toward the question that Sky just asked, which is how do we, how, how do people who want to advocate for a better outcome a better set of tactics and, and procedures and therefore outcomes as Sky was uh, uh, just working me over on. Uh, how do we recommend, or how, how can uh, advocates advance those uh, those mm -hmm. interests? So I, I, uh, I think I'd like to hear from each of you, I, well, not me, I think our audience would like to hear from each of you guys on those questions. Great, Let's start with you, happy, sure, yeah. I'm happy to jump in. I mean, first on this very important question of how COVID is impacting the response. I mean, you can imagine in a country where the healthcare infrastructure has been so decimated, um, where capacity has been so constrained, you know, COVID has just multiplied the impacts. And that shows up most powerfully in the fact that um, the fatality rate in Yemen is the highest in the world um, with respect to COVID infection, five times greater than the global average. Um, and the other impact it's had is just to exacerbate the range of um, both bureaucratic constraints 
and movement constraints on humanitarians that we faced previously, um, now under cover of COVID, um, and has resulted in a further 25% drop in uh, the real's value and steep drops in remittances, growing in, in uh, growing um, food insecurity, um, and you know an, an increase in food insecurity um, uh, and inadequate food consumption that's now jumped from 28% to 43% in three months. Um, so just you know take any one of these impacts that I described previously and you know, increase them by 30%. And that's what we're facing on the ground alongside as noted ever increasing bureaucratic impediments. I wanna come back to this question of advocacy as well. And some of the solutions you identified Dennis that um, were really important constraints and guidelines on US action in Yemen and US action vis-a-vis -vis its partners. And the other complementary piece of that is extending those constraints and extending those obligations to our allies, you know, to the Saudi-led coalition. And, um, and I wanna speak to the power of advocacy and to the power of Sky's film, because what advocates have sought to do over these last uh, few years is really transform Yemen from a distant war and, you know, sort of theater of counter-terror activity um, and a notion of sort of surgical intervention um, to acknowledgement, and again, this is what Sky's film does, that it is the largest humanitarian crisis in the world, and it's a function in part of, you know, U.S., U.K., and allied engagement um, from the Saudi-led coalition. Um, and, you know, in, in seeking to make that transformation from, you know, distant theater of war to largest man-made humanitarian crisis in which the U.S. plays a role, we've seen a real shift in congressional action from over two-thirds of the Senate approving arms sales in 2017 to now the House and Senate aligned in 2019 and in bipartisan fashion, passing multiple pieces of legislation to constrain U.S. action in Yemen. Um, and I often say that, um, you know, of the eight vetoes that President Trump has had to issue over the course of his administration, four of them have had to do with what Congress wanted to do in constraining our action and placing constraints on our allies and conditioning our arms sales um, such that we are elevating humanitarian concerns in Yemen. And the other thing I want to note is that even though he vetoed each and every one of those pieces of legislation, you know, the fact that there was this increased international scrutiny, this increased congressional scrutiny on, you know, the use and methodology of U.S. provided arms and tactics in the war and lack of fidelity to uh, civilian protection resulted in a 60 percent drop in 2019 of bombings on civilians and civilian infrastructure. That's very real. And what's happened um, in this environment of donor fatigue, as Raul talked about, and distraction as a result of COVID and multiple other distractions, is we've now seen, um, you know, we've now seen uh, that same uh, distraction contributing to an escalation of violence. So in the first half of 2020, airstrikes more than doubled the rate of the previous six months, and nearly 40% again hit civilians or civilian infrastructure. And, and Rahul, if I could please. Actually, yeah. Thank you, Nasrul. And, uh, and 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 if, if if I could actually add on to that, uh, Naz, you, said, you you spoke about remittances, and this is something that I've actually seen across the world because the one thing that COVID hit was global economies, and it hit the poor and the working class much harder than it actually hit uh, hit middle classes and and other people who can who can zoom from home. And so in the refugee camps where I've actually, uh, in, in three different areas in the world, the biggest issue has been the decline of remittances of local informal economies because of lockdowns, the increase of police brutality that in some cases killed more people than COVID or put more people in hospital than, than COVID did, and ultimately served to place more burden on the relief, uh, the relief uh, industry of uh, the relief world to essentially fill in the gaps that were actually being filled in by those by, by those informal economies, and what you were saying about about uh, about the reality of the fa fact that the bipartisan and the international outrage against attacks on civilians led to a decline, and then again uh, 
when the distraction came in and, and everybody turned to look inward, the refugee became a disposable commodity, the asylum seeker, the war, um, the, the, the war victim, essentially a survivor, be, became somebody whose needs are secondary to uh, massive unemployment in donor countries, to, to economic uh, uh, collapse in donor countries. And that's where I actually wanted to bring out that, that there has to be an anticipation that your allies are who they are. We don't, we can't, we can't choose. Uh, and, and, and the fact that they, they would actually most likely not obey the restrictions that you're placing on, on, uh, on yourself. It, it has to be something that is taken into the calculus. And, and, and one thing I did want to say is that even if we give more money to the international relief community and so on and so forth, the structure of relief that has been built over the past 50 years is precisely about just keeping things going. We're going to need a massive systemic overhaul to make sure that the different organizations that are working in the, on the front line are working together and they're not, uh, they're not, their efforts are not redundant or their efforts don't leave large gaps and so on and so forth. So, so, uh, so again, I mean, either we need a correction, maybe COVID is a good way to essentially look at this, but it has to be at every level of this engagement. It cannot just be ground level people. The people working on the ground, they know exactly what's going on. However, there's institutional inertia, there's institutional restrictions, there's, there's rules of different countries about how aid can be used to what it can be provided. And then you have the non-state actors, the fighters and so on and so forth who are appropriating it for, for, their, own, for, for their own particular use. So one way is you have to go at it from both the top and the bottom. And I'm just gonna give a, an example about how do you provide human rights and basic needs to refugees who are, who, are, who are living in camps for 30 years. And a human rights lawyer in Kenya told me very, very, very clear. Uh, he said, it's not going to work if, an, if the head of the WFP or UNHCR or the, uh, goes to the head of state. It has to come from the American head of state. It has to come from the Chinese head of state. It has to, it has to come from these powerful nodes in global politics and real pressure needs to be put that actually has consequences for people who violate the restrictions that we've placed on, uh, on, on, on our alliances. Short of that, it's actually very difficult to see how we can actually move on. And we're just gonna see more films like Skies Coming Out. Um, and we're gonna see uh, more, more organizations that are gonna have more trouble delivering even the basic, the, the basic services to more and more uh, destitute people. So where Nas and Ra Rahul, you guys come together is on this pressure. And so the, to the student, the questioners, that advocacy can end up having that, those two outcomes, pressure on Mike Pompeo, U.S. Secretary of State, U.S. Head of State, pressure from Congress uh, to get that done. Sky, I want, I want to hear your uh, reaction to this, but um, we're getting close to closing statements. So we've, so. There's also two really interesting questions expressly to you, which is any update on the status of a beer and one and two, how did you decide whose lens to tell the story through? And was it expressly a decision to uh, tell the story from the perspective of women uh, in the movie? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> to speak to a beer, um, the girl in the north and Makia's clinic. She's doing quite well, actually. So we're in sort of bi-weekly contact um, with her um, through a colleague. And she has stuck to this new diet and has the medicine she needs and her body's slowly recovering. So if you recall, she was 15 pounds uh, when we were uh, spending time with her. And I think she's up to 25 maybe now, um, 22, 25. So she's gained quite a bit of good weight um, and is much healthier than before. In terms of the decision of, um, of whose story to tell um, in these clinics, you know, um, we, we started working with um, these cl clinics and hospitals almost a year um, in some in some instances before before we arrived because um, we just couldn't tell a story like this without building trust over a long period of time and so um, 
So, so we, we spend a lot of time relationship building, um, both with the administrators and the nurses and doctors and staff, but also with the families that were in the clinics and the hospital themselves. And so, you know, the first conversation was always um, sh just sharing what we were trying to achieve, the kind of story we were trying to tell, and then asking if they wanted to participate, right? So just that that's the foundation for everything, right? And some families wanted to, and frankly, some didn't. And so for any families that, that um, felt like they didn't, you know, want to participate, we, we didn't cover them at all. We didn't film them. We didn't, we didn't we tried to stay as far away from them from the cameras as, as possible. And, and we noted that in all of our, our camera notes. Um, in terms of our, our, the actual girls and the staff that we followed, um, both, both Abir in the North and Omeima in the South, um, they, they were sort of, um, for different reasons, the darlings of the medical staff there. They were both just really, um, really beautiful young girls that the, that the medical staff cared deeply about. And it was obvious that their families also were very invested in, in their recovery. And so um, when we first talked with them and the families, they were some of the most, um, how do I put it? They, they, were, they were most interested in participating, frankly. And they happened to be admitted to the clinics and the hospitals right about the same time that we arrived. So there was a confluence of fortune there as well in terms of our time in country and, and they're being admitted at the same time where we could sort of track their progress over time. So that was, that was just sort of a, a, an assessment as we moved through the story on making those sort of subjective decisions um, based on, on who we talked with and who wanted to participate. So I just thought uh, on the question of whether to tell the story from the nurse and the doctor, both women, was that, was that, uh, can you just give us one, two more sentences on that? Was it, was it expressly uh, a decision to tell it from the perspective of a woman? Well, well I'd been in contact with both Makia and Dr. Aida in the South um, before we arrived in country. And um, from talking with colleagues and people who had worked in the hospitals and clinics, I knew that they were essentially local heroes who okay. had dedicated the bulk of their professional lives um, to this space of pediatric malnutrition in a way that few others had. And so it just, for me, was the logical choice to really showcase and, and, and demonstrate how, how these dedicated women were doing this you know, pretty heroic work with very few resources. That's for sure. Okay, guys, we're, we're, at, we're, we're one minute out, so we're gonna ask uh, for just one minute closing statements and we're gonna go reverse order so from what we started so we can give Sky last word. Well, let me go Rahul, then Naz, and then Sky, you'll get the last word. Um, closing, closing comments, Rahul. Okay, so, so one of the things that, that I found in my research is that the more the interaction with, with, with people, the more awareness, it does have a social impact. And one of the things that we found in the camps was that the further away you get from the camps, the less the positive um, uh, ideas people have about refugees. So uh, when I saw the film, right, I didn't see it just as a person who studies refugees in war. I actually saw the film as a father who, as, as a parent, who, who cannot even fathom the idea of losing a child and to see the anguish of the women and the doctors, they've not run out of tears. The nurses have not run out of tears and, and they're just frustrated. So right now we've got 80 million displaced people and more added of COVID. And it's, it's placed a huge burden on us, but as humanity, this, this, is, this is our turning point, right? Are we actually better than this or, 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 or are we not? So not only donations, but we are actually going to need policy change backed by political commitment and, and action. And this is something that the new group of students who are going to rise through the ranks, whether of policymaking, whether of politics, whether of economics, a commitment from across the various stakeholders in a global world to, 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 for, so that the abeers of the world don't have to suffer this anymore. Here, here. Here, here, Naz. Here, here. Um, well, I think I would say that we are entering a really dangerous period in this 
long running war with tremendous civilian impact. And it's very clear that military solutions are not, are totally off the table. Um, you know, uh, the lines of conflict uh, have increased. Um, there are now 47 front lines of this conflict up from just 33 um, in just January. So parties to the conflict are proliferating. They're not decreasing. Um, the roadmap uh, that was sort of the original North Star of a potential political settlement is increasingly out of reach because of the way the conflict is proliferating and the actors and stakeholders within it are proliferating. And at the same time, donor fatigue is setting in. The humanitarian response plan for Yemen this year is only 20% funded. The U.S. has halved its contribution to it compared to last year and suspended aid in many Houthi-controlled areas, to Rahul's points earlier about the way in which aid is being used. What we need and what Yemenis need, most importantly, um, are civilians at the center of policy. You know, increased aid, resumption of aid that's been suspended, pressure on all parties to ensure humanitarian access, accountability for violations of international humanitarian law, and use of all leverage to drive parties to the negotiating table for, as you noted, Dennis, a diplomatic solution to this outcome because the military one is out of reach. No, uh, here, here. Thank you for that. Sky, uh, you brought us here, your work, uh, so you, you get the final word. All right. So um, personally, for a moment, in, in 2005, I was filming in Cambodia, in rural Cambodia, and there was a villager who was winching a 250-pound bomb out of a, out of a pit um, in order to sell the, the scrap metal and the explosives, the TNT inside. And when he got it to the lip of, of this pit he dug, he, he, he rubbed off sort of the dirt on the side of it and peered in. And then he turned to me and he said, do you want your bomb back? And that moment has haunted me ever since. That was 15 years ago. And so, you know, speaking specifically about this project, before I started it, I knew of the conflict. I knew the US was complicit in the conflict, but I didn't know that our tax dollars were contributing to conditions leading to the starvation of children. You know, it's enough that a child can die of starvation in modern times, but to know that we as American citizens are complicit in that is something that I can't turn away from. And, and I hope none of us will. I hope, I hope we can look at this and see and then act to ensure that we as a nation don't continue our current complicity in the starvation of Yemeni children. Thanks very much, Sky, uh, for that challenge. Uh, your film, um, in fact, your films uh, make that challenge um, all the more likely. Uh, thanks, Rahul and Naz. Uh, I want to thank the teams of people who put this together. I want to note uh, our colleagues, uh, Maura Policelli. Uh, and and Reardon, as well as um, Sky, your partner uh, in this effort, your core producer, Mike, uh, as well as your team, Michael and Chelsea and Su Susan and Julia and Jordan and Vince and Alyssa. Uh, thank you all for this. Um, that's a, a very worthy charge for you to leave uh, our attendees with, uh, Sky. Thank you for that. So thank you, all. thank you everybody. Uh, and thanks one more time to Sky and your team. Thanks. Thank you so much.